All right, in this scene over here, I want to make ECG interpretation extremely easy. Many people have a lot of difficulty understanding ECG readings. So in this video, I'm going to clarify it, and at the end, we'll have some cool mnemonics. So let's begin. I'm going to begin by borrowing our friend's heart over here. You may be wondering why it's color-coded. Well, let's explain. When it comes to understanding ECGs, there are three arteries that we want to keep in mind. The left anterior descending artery, which we can see over here in orange. As you can see, the distribution of the left anterior descending artery includes the anterior part of the left ventricular myocardium. It also supplies the anterior part of the interventricular septum. So if there was an occlusion over here by this artery, it would obviously affect the anterior part of the myocardium. We often refer to this area as anteroseptal. Now don't worry yet about what I mean over here by V1, V2, V3, V4. Really soon, I'm going to make this extremely easy and explain what this is talking about. Then we get up to the next artery, the left circumflex artery, which we can see right over here. This artery, as we can see over here, supplies the lateral part of the left ventricular myocardium. LCX over here stands for lateral circumflex. Don't worry about the fact that I've included LAD over here and that I've broken it up into anterolateral and lateral. As we're going to see soon, this is not going to be so relevant for us. The important thing is to recognize that the lateral circumflex supplies the lateral part of the left ventricular myocardium. We can see that distribution a little bit better. And then we get to the right coronary artery. The right coronary artery over here supplies various things, but when it comes to ECGs, what you need to recognize is that it supplies the inferior part of the myocardium. That is, the inferior wall of the left ventricular myocardium. As we can see over here, color-coded in pink, the right coronary artery is supplying the inferior wall of the left ventricular myocardium. Okay, now let's take a look at our friend over here. I'm going to now explain what V1, V2, etc. is all about with some fun mnemonics. We recall the heart that we just saw a few moments ago. And now we have these spokes coming out of it, pointing to these weird letters and numbers. Let's take a look. These spokes, of course, represent the leads of the ECG. Over here we see V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. These are the leads which point horizontally away from the heart. And then we have AVR, AVL, and AVF. R, of course, stands for right, L for left, and F for foot, along with leads 1, 2, and 3. We can see that these leads are not pointing horizontally away from the person's body, but they're along the frontal plane. All right, now let's start explaining what's going on. Remember we spoke about the different regions of the heart that were color-coded? We can probably already tell which parts of the ECG this is going to affect. Let's imagine we had an infarction affecting the left part of the myocardium. Where will we see changes on the ECG? Well, let's take a look. Which letters and numbers were in that direction? We saw a 1 over there. We saw AVL over there, along with V5 and V6. So again, in the case of an infarction, which affects the lateral part of the myocardium, we're going to see changes on the ECG, along leads 1, AVL, V5, and V6. And again, don't worry at all if you don't remember this. I'm going to have a really cool mnemonic at the end in order to make this a lot easier. Okay, now let's take the case of an infarction which would affect the anterior part of the myocardium. In which leads would we see changes? Well, which leads were facing the anterior part of the heart? V1, V2, V3, and V4. So again, in an infarction which affects the anterior part of the myocardium, which is generally associated with a left anterior descending artery infarction, we would see changes at V1, V2, V3, and V4. All right, finally, let's imagine we had an infarction which affected the inferior part of the myocardium. Where would we see changes on the ECG? I leads 2, leads 3, and AVF, which we could see over here. Before we get to how we see these changes on an actual ECG, let's get to the mnemonic. We see these arrows over here. Let's take a look at what each of them say. Over here it says, two to three feet below are my toes. Don't worry about are my toes. Just remember, two to three feet below. Two, three reminds us of leads two and three, and feet. Feet reminds us of F, AVF, that leads two, three, and AVF are below. They're inferior. Over here we see the arrow that's pointing anteriorly, which again we refer to as anteroseptal. And there's a little rhyme over here. It says, one, two, three, four, anteroseptal. One, two, three, four, anteroseptal. 
a pretty awful rhyme. Perhaps we need to sing it. One, two, three, four, enteroceptal. One, two, three, four, enteroceptal. Wow, that was pretty awful. But you get the idea. V1, V2, V3, and V4 are the anteroceptal leads. And finally, apparently there's someone who loves the numbers 5 and 6. So much so that they made this sign over here that says, I love 5 and 6. The I reminds us of 1, Lee 1, L for AVL, and 5 and 6 for leads 5 and 6. V5 and V6. So again, leads 1, AVL, V5 and V6 all point laterally. That's why this arrow is pointed laterally. Remember, we spoke about the left anterior descending infarction. This affected the anteroceptal regions of the myocardium, and this corresponded to changes in the anterior portion of the heart, and this corresponded to changes at V1, V2, V3, and V4. Take a look at this orange part over here of the ECG. When you see changes in these parts of the ECG, which we'll talk about soon, you know you're talking about an anteroceptal infarction. And then we spoke about the lateral infarction, which was generally associated with the lateral circumflex. That's when we saw changes in 1 AVL, V5, and V6. Remember, I love 5 and 6. This corresponds to the green portions of this ECG reading over here. And finally, we spoke about infarctions affecting the inferior part of the myocardium, which was generally associated with the right coronary artery. This was associated with changes in 2, 3, and AVF. This corresponds to the magenta part of this ECG over here. So if you see ECG changes in these leads over here, you know you're talking about an inferior infarction. We're going to be taking a look at some really cool things really soon, including a white wolf and a banana. You may be wondering, why are we going to be talking about a white wolf and a banana? I'll explain, and they're going to really help us learn about EKG interpretation. But before we get to that, let's just review the most basic EKG. We recall over here the most basic graph of an EKG. We recall the P wave, which represents atrial depolarization, the QRS complex, which represents ventricular depolarization, and the T wave, which represents ventricular repolarization. Keep in mind this ST segment over here. The ST segment is between the QRS complex and the T wave. This ST segment is so important when it comes to myocardial infarction, as we're about to see. So welcome to our first room over here. We see STEMI. STEMI sort of sounds like the stem of a plant. STEMI is for ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. What does that mean? Well, take a look over here on top. We see the graph of the normal rhythm. We see the ST segments between QRS and the T wave. And then we see ST segment elevation where it's elevated. This is what we see in STEMI, in an ST segment elevated myocardial infarction. Now, where do we see this on the leads on the bottom? Because this is what we're going to come across in the hospital, as well as on exams. Well, take a look at leads 2, 3, and AVF. We see ST segment elevation. Now, why is it only in leads 2, 3, and AVF? Do you remember what leads 2, 3, and AVF corresponded to? These were the leads which pointed towards the inferior myocardium. And therefore, since we see ST segment elevation in these leads, we know we're talking about a problem in the inferior myocardium. That is, there's a myocardial infarction probably caused by a right coronary artery infarction, which leads to infarction of the inferior part of the myocardium. That's why we only see ST segment elevations in leads 2, 3, and AVF. Now, I know this may be difficult to see, but as you go through EKGs, this will become more and more simple. And don't worry, on exam day, it won't give you things that are really difficult. EKGs on exams are very straightforward. Now let's contrast that with this EKG over here. Here we see a STEMI that's anteroceptal lateral. Well, what does that mean? Well, do you recall what anteroceptal means? That means we're going to see changes in these leads over here. V1, V2, V3, and V4. And do you remember which leads correspond to lateral? Leads 1, AVL, V5, and V6. Well, let's take a look over here. Over here again, we see ST segment elevation, and we see it in these V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. So since we're talking about V1 through V4, we know we're talking about an anteroceptal myocardial infarction, and since we're including V5 and V6, we know we're including the lateral ones as well. We could probably see that in lead one over here too. So we're talking about an anteroceptal lateral ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. And I know this may be tricky, but as you go through various EKGs, it becomes more and more simple. All right, now we get to the white wolf over here. Why is there a white wolf over here? That's because in this room, we're going to talk about Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. In Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, we see this delta wave. It's like a slight upslanting of the QRS wave. 
Maybe I'll stick it right on the White Wolf himself. All right, there we go. We see our Delta Wave on the White Wolf. Again, this reminds us of the Delta Wave seen in Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome. Now, just in terms of pathophysiology, this syndrome is due to an abnormally fast accessory conduction pathway from the atria to the ventricles. It bypasses the rate slowing AV node, leading to the ventricles partially depolarizing earlier. That's why there's this upslanting over here, because it depolarizes earlier than it's supposed to. If you see this graph on exam day, they might ask you what the treatment for Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome is, and just for your information, it's procainamide. In this room, we're going to talk about AFib and A flutter, atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. In atrial fibrillation, we're going to see what are described as irregularly irregular waves. They're not spaced out properly, and there are no discrete P waves. Remember, the P wave represented atrial depolarization. In AFib, we don't see any of these normal P waves. And I have my buddy up over here, AFib, who showed up in our AFib video. Now let's take a look at what this looks like. We can see over here in V3, these irregularly irregular spaced waves. This is how AFib may show up on exam day. Underneath, we see a flutter, which has a classic sawtooth pattern, which is why we have this saw in the room over here. The saw for the sawtooth pattern. Again, this represents atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is when there's rapid succession of identical consecutive atrial depolarization waves. These consecutive atrial depolarization waves are what cause the sawtooth appearance. All right, now let's come up to our next room over here on pulmonary embolism. The pulmonary embolism, ECG, comes up on exams pretty often, and it's pretty hard to tell exactly what it is. But if you go through a bunch of ECGs, you'll be able to tell. There's what's described as an S1, Q3, T3, where we see the deep S wave in lead one, the deep Q wave in lead three, as well as an inverted T wave in lead three. Then we get up to the banana room. Bananas are high in potassium, so it makes me think of kalemia hypo or hyperkalemia. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So if you recall, we only spoke about the P wave, the QRS, and the T wave. There's also a, a very, very shallow U wave that may be present. In hypokalemia, there's going to be a prominent U wave. So on exam day, they might show you this prominent U wave and then ask you about something about hypokalemia. As opposed to in hyperkalemia, we see a tall peaked T wave. This is how we know we're talking about hyperkalemia. Perhaps you could think about this sharp T wave as being very hyper. It's very hyper, so it's going very high up and being very sharp. So it's hyper. This hyper T wave is all about hyperkalemia. And again, this banana over here reminded us that we were in the banana room or the potassium room. All right, our next room over here where we see these QT letters over here. They're very cute, but they're very prolonged. And that's why in this room over here, we're talking about the prolonged QT. If you get to exam day and you see that the QT interval is so big, you know you're talking about a prolonged QT. And there are a lot of things that can cause a prolonged QT. For example, fluoroquinolones are one thing that could cause a prolonged QT. Antipsychotics, antidepressants, antiemetics, and antifungals can also cause a prolonged QT, along with the protease inhibitors and opioids. Finally, antiarrhythmics as well as arsenic and macrolides can all cause a prolonged QT. And then we take a look at these blocks over here in this room. These AV blocks remind us of AV block. And we have a famous poem behind these blocks to remind us of the various types of AV block. If R is far from P, then you have a first degree. This means that there's a prolonged PR interval, which we can see very small over here. This is what a first degree AV block is all about. Then we come up to the second degree AV block, and there's two types, Mobitz type 1 and Mobitz type 2. Mobitz type 1 is also called a Wenkebach, which is why the song goes, longer, longer, longer drop, then you have a Wenkebach. Did I say longer too many times? I'm not sure. Longer, longer drop, you have a Wenkebach. In Mobitz type 1, or in Wenkebach, there's progressive lengthening of the PR interval until a beat is dropped. That is, a P wave is not followed by a QRS complex. This condition actually is usually asymptomatic and treatment is generally not required. As opposed to in Mobitz type 2, where we requ require a pacemaker, what happens in Mobitz type 2? Well, it says, if some P's don't get through, you have a Mobitz type 2. This means there are dropped beats that are not preceded by a change in the PR interval. Mobitz type 2 may progress to a third degree block, since it usually indicates that there's some abnormality in structure, such as ischemia, fibrosis, or sclerosis. Finally, we get up to the third degree AV block. If P's and Q's don't agree, then you have a third degree. This means that the P waves and the QRS complexes are rhythmically disassociated. The atria and the ventricles beat independently of each other. 
This, of course, is not sustainable and requires a pacemaker. In this last room, we just see a few ECGs of some rhythms that you may come across. Sinus bradycardia, where the heart rate is slow, or tachycardia, where it's fast. Supraventricular tachycardia, along with premature atrial contraction. All of these are pretty self-explanatory. Here we see premature ventricular contraction, where the ventricle contracts too soon, along with ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, which kind of lo just looks like random squiggly lines. All right, I hope you enjoyed this scene on ECG interpretation. Take care.